The scripture reading this evening is from the book of Judges, chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. Judges 2, 6 through 15. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Erez, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hands of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, The hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Good evening. Good to see you all again this evening. Thank you, John, for the good reading, and, and uh, kind of forgot there were a couple of those names, but you handled those just fine. Appreciative of that very much. Um, I was sitting there thinking that probably what would be a very good idea, be a great way to start the program, although it's kind of officially going to be starting on uh, Tuesday when Sam will show up at the office bright and early, but could just have him come up and speak right now extemporaneously. And uh, I don't know, it would be a great comparison to maybe what we'd get now and get maybe a year from now, but anyway. But we've already heard Sam speak once before, did an outstanding job, and exhibits already such a wonderful attitude. Uh, his father, David, is going to be leaving, uh, flying out this evening, go back up to Washington. And so uh, they may have to leave you know, a certain time to be able to get to the airport, but we wish you the very best and safe travels for you and uh, wish your family the best and I told Dave this morning I said we will try our best to take good care of his his son and uh, so we look forward to that question that I want to ask for you in the very beginning is I think an important question it is one that's not rhetorical I do want you to think about it and try to think of an answer though I think and I hope that we would come to some common agreement of this, the answer to this question, though there are several factors that are involved. But why is it that we emphasize so much the importance of Bible study? Now, I know what maybe you immediately think, and you might be saying, well, it's God's Word, it's the Bible, and is there any information that is any more important than the Word of God? And, of course, the answer is there is no information more important than that. But I want us to think a little bit deeper than that. We often appeal to passages like 2 Timothy 2.15, even as the Old King James Version would say, study to show thyself approved to God, a worker that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing one that rightly divides the word of truth. We know that the New King James Version and some of the other uh, translations says, be diligent to show yourselves approved to God. But one thing that is very clear within 2 Timothy 2.15 is that we have a responsibility to rightly divide, handle with accuracy, the word of truth. And that's going to take study, diligent study, a diligent investigation of God's word. But why do we emphasize this so much? And I want to say to you that in many respects, and certainly the direction that I want to go, 
that I think for many reasons is for the preservation of our spiritual heritage. For the preservation of our spiritual heritage as Christians and as the body of Christ. If we do not continue to open our Bibles, read our Bibles, study our Bibles carefully, contextually, accurately, then our spiritual heritage will be in danger. Historically, that has been proven to be the case more times than really should have ever been because people did not apply themselves to the Word of God. I do appreciate in Sam's prayer this evening in the opening of services of how important it is for us to look to Scripture and to apply what we read and what we consider and what we study. You see, apostasy... Apostasy is always just around the corner, especially when one generation fails to properly prepare the next generation. And this problem is well articulated in the book of Judges. Two different times you will find the statement in the book of Judges, in Judges chapter 17 and in verse 6, then at the end of the book, in Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, that the author lets Everyone know that at that time there was no king in Israel. And everyone or every man did what? What was right in their own eyes or in their own sight. That's a scary thought. Regardless of the generation, regardless of the society that exists, when everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes and it comes down to that kind of religious, philosophical subjectivity, then problems will ensue and this will seriously infect the body of Christ. And our spiritual heritage is in danger when we are not opening our Bibles as God wants us to, reading and studying and meditating and applying. This certainly was the case in the days of the judges. We understand that when you start calculating the chronology as much as we possibly can, this period of the judges, which would take us even into the ministry of Samuel and 1 Samuel, is a period of time of just short of 400 years, probably about 375 years or so. I want you to think about that. Because as we think of Bible times, and we have this patriarchal age of 2,500 years covered in one book, the book of Genesis, and at minimum 2,500 years, that's after the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Then we have from the book of Exodus through Malachi, and we have a period of time there that is about 1,100 years, and then 400 years of prophetic silence between Malachi and the emergence of John the Baptist, 1,500 years, until it brings us to John the Baptist and ultimately Jesus Christ. And we think in those terms, and we think, okay, that's a lot of years, but what's 375 or 400 years? Uh, how old is our nation? 237 or something like that years old? It's a considerable period of time. And as we look at Israel and we see what happened to them at these times historically, no wonder we have the statement that Paul makes that we refer to quite frequently in Romans 15.4 that whatever things were written before, that is the Old Testament, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. God wants us to learn the lessons of the Old Testament. It's not that we necessarily have to become fluent in an old law that we're no longer under, and yet it is important that we recognize that law, appreciate what it was, and there's nothing wrong with learning it. But what he really wants us to appreciate, and what Paul is saying, is that there are lessons to be learned when you look at the history of the Old Testament, and namely the children of Israel. The period of the time of Judges was a difficult, difficult time for Israel. But maybe it was just one of many difficult times for Israel. In the reading that we had, and John read for us from verse 6 and going through verse 15, and of course we see that Joshua was a very good leader for Israel, he who had taken the mantle from Moses, so to speak. 
And this probably was one of the strongest periods of time for Israel was under the leadership of Joshua. Joshua was a remarkable leader and he leads the children of Israel into the land of Canaan, what, what we often refer to in this period of time in the conquest of Canaan. And Israel, while certainly it had some problems along the way, Joshua was a good leader and they're being faithful. And that's exactly what it says. But then Joshua dies. And then every man goes to his own house and we see what happens even as was read there. But I want you to now drop back down where John, after where John left off in verse 15, let's pick up at verse 16 in Judges chapter 2. Because we see the problem that has existed. The wickedness and the evil that was prevailing in the land of Canaan after the death of Joshua. And the the years are going by and apostasy has found its way into Israel. And so what does the Lord do? Verse 16, the Lord raises up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. The Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I command their fathers, commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice, I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died, so that through them I may test Israel whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. This is a very difficult and, again, deplorable time. And we look at this, and again, we see what is going on during this period of time, and one generation serves the Lord, the next does not. A judge rises up, seems to help the situation, fix the situation, there's deliverance, That judge dies and they revert back. And what does it say? The next generation even becomes more apostate, more corrupt. You know, my question is, who is the next generation? And I don't mean just in the days of judges. That as we would look at the chronology and see the history of Israel and just how bad it became. But I pose the question to you, who is the next generation? And it is here that we learn the lessons from this period of time in the Old Testament. That as we understand, we too must do all that we can to preserve our spiritual heritage. Because who is the next generation? I can remember, and Vicki and I will talk about this from time to time, but being when we were very young. And I mean very young, even when we were just small children and attending church services together and Bible classes and worship when we were youngsters in Cayucas. And thinking about the generation that was really leading the church at that time in Cayucas, involving our parents, for example, and other great families that were there. And one thing about it is I, as a young child, I looked at the time when I looked at my mom and dad and when I looked at Paul and Doris Fields, who in time would become my in-laws, they certainly weren't then, but I, I don't care if it was them or if it was the Merrimans or the Caspers or some of the old families that existed. There's one thing I remember as a young child. I'd look at them and say, man, they are old. <laughs> and little did I realize That as they looked at and saw how important it was to train and to educate spiritually, biblically the next generation, because we were the next generation. And now so when I look at this and we look at these and we see we have a few generations that are here that are represented. 
And if we look at a generation that would now involve my children or the Barkas' children and others with that age that we see, so many as I see right here in these few pews and, and going around and we see who is the next generation. But who is the next generation? You're going to turn around and you're going to see the same kind of things and the next thing we know, we're looking at Elijah. We're looking at Micah and Matthew and Brian and Brian. So I know I'd get his attention if I did that. Who is the next generation? I want to ask you, is preserving the spiritual heritage so important because this generation is important to us? We note the order, the degradation seen in the text and the devastation that it had for Israel and all that we learn from that. And all I can say to you, and I'm just going to go over these points somewhat rapidly, and I'll tell you why. I'm tired. <laughs> Let me suggest to you that when we look at the text in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, that it addresses the problem, the dilemma of spiritual illiteracy. A generation that did not know the Lord. When all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. I just cannot emphasize enough the sadness, the tragedy of that statement, of the sentiment of that statement. A new generation that did not know the Lord. My heart would ache if my children did not know the Lord. My heart will ache if it ever comes to the point that they stop knowing the Lord or that my grandchildren would not know the Lord. And my heart, heart would ache for any of the younger generation here in this congregation and others as we have visitors from other places that as you too are concerned about the spiritual heritage of your own congregation. The very, very idea of a generation not knowing the Lord. And all we can say is that truth and faithfulness does not come automatically. Truth and faithfulness is not an accident. It is not something that we just kind of do as a church and put into autopilot and just assume that our young people, our young boys and girls, young men and women, young married couples are necessarily going to get it and do it unless we involve ourselves in a concerted effort to teach them the scripture and to make sure that they are knowing and learning scripture because we know what happens to a generation when it doesn't know the Lord this is our responsibility to prepare the next generation in the well known passage often referred to as the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and in Deuteronomy chapter 6, there Moses is, is declaring to the children of Israel, now this is the commandment of these of the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. He told them this earlier. The Shema that listen, to hear, listen. That's what the Hebrew word Shema means. To listen is in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today, this is Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Morning, noon, and night. It is a saturation. It is an immersion into God's word. And it was important. And there was a failure to do that. And because there was a failure to do that, another generation arises that does not know the Lord. And when it happens again and, and again and again, the corruption becomes more severe. That's what it says. And that's what happened. When you, go, when you stay in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and you drop on down to verse 20, it's interesting. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, and judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? You know what? First of all, we want our children asking those questions. We want our children asking those questions. And if our children come up and ask us questions like, Why do we do what we do? 
Even if they're doing it in kind of a challenging way. Why do we make such a big emphasis on the Lord's Supper? Why do we teach what we teach about baptism? Why do we teach and all of these various things? I'm going to tell you what. We should just be so happy they're asking the questions. But then are we prepared with open Bibles to answer them and show them and teach them and encourage them? What is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, the judgments the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, in verse 21, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all of his household. And he goes on to talk about that history that was so germane to Israel. When you think of Moses and Egyptian bondage, was it important for the newer generations, these generations that were coming, was it important for them to know their own history? Yes. You want to know something? It's important for our young people to know our history too. The history of the establishment of the Lord's church. Of what the gospel was in the New Testament days. It's important for them to even to see the ensuing apostasy that took place. It's important for them to understand and to be able to make a delineation. To know the difference in what happened in a reformation of the 15th and 16th century. As opposed to a restoration spirit in the 19th century. It's important for them to know. I want our children and my grandchildren to understand why Caiuchus even came into existence. Why it became a congregation there. It's important for them to know that history. If we're walking in the light and doing truth, then we need to teach them. But most importantly, we need to teach them God's word because spiritual illiteracy is devastating. It's devastating. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29, when Jesus had been challenged by some Pharisees and they're trying to trick Jesus anyway... But I love the response of Jesus in Matthew 22 and verse 29. And after they come up with this confounded hypothetical situation, Jesus simply responds to them. He says, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And let me tell you why so many people err or why they are in error. Biblically. Spiritually, religiously, it's because they don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. It's why the Apostle Paul makes it so clear in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. He says to Timothy, working with the congregation in Ephesus, These things command and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. He says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by the prophecy, the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourselves entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Our children need to hear the truth. They need to hear it from us. And not only do they need to hear it from us, they need to see us live it. We've got to be aware of the danger of spiritual literacy. May I also suggest to you, though, then, that we go back to our text in Judges chapter 2, and here was this massive forsaking the Lord, forsaking of the Lord. And we see this in verse 11 in the text. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baals. And they forsook the Lord, God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. Verse 13 as well. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. These were Canaanites. Gods. Baal was a masculine god, and the Ashtoreth was a feminine goddess, a goddess of the Canaanite people. Can you imagine? You see, what happened in those years before? When we saw in Deuteronomy 6, Moses is telling the children of Israel that we've got to teach our children and they're going to ask questions and we've got to remind them about Egypt. We've got to remind them about the power of God and how he defeated the Egyptians and that the gods of Egypt were, were not even real gods and the gods of the Canaanites are not real gods and, and all of these things. But we've got to teach them and show them that. They failed to do that. 
And so they forsook the Lord. They did evil and they forsook the Lord because of the corruptness of the generation that came. And they became, I'll tell you what, they became uninterested. They became uninterested in studying the law, the word of God. Brethren, I want to say to you, and in fact, I want you to look at a passage, interesting statement by the prophet Jeremiah. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah 15, verse 6, it is. Because I'm going to suggest to you that forsaking is going backwards. And we know that in some later history in the prophecies and the work of Jeremiah the prophet, and again, once again, Israel had become quite profligate in its attitude and its actions. But in Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 6, you have this warning that is given. And God speaks very directly to them through the prophet. And here's what the Lord God says in verse 6 of chapter 15. You have forsaken me, says the Lord. You have gone backward. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am weary of relenting. You know, think about it. How many times did God... Show forth patience, patience, and patience, and would have punished them, and then he relented, and he relented, and he relented. And he says, I'm tired of your forsaking, because forsaking, he said, is going backward. This is the problem, again, from generation to generation. That every time a new generation comes up and there's less teaching and there's less teaching, there's less activity, there's less involvement, do you understand that we're just losing a little bit more and we're losing a little bit more? And the hole gets deeper and deeper. Do you all hear what I'm saying? Does that make sense to you? That with each passing generation, it becomes weaker and weaker. It becomes more diluted in its spirituality. When people stop learning about God, there can only be one outcome, and that's digression. And God is going to forsake those who forsake him. Certainly Moses had warned the children of Israel of that in Deuteronomy 31. And he says, if you forsake me, I will forsake you. We do not want God forsaking us. But I want to say again that when people stop learning about God, that outcome will be digression. Jesus said... Jesus warned in John chapter 6 and verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets. This is in verse 45 of John 6. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. But mark it down that if they're not being taught, they're not learning. They're not drawing closer to God. Again, the generations come and there is a distancing, a further distancing of generations to the God of heaven. They had within their generation spiritual illiteracy, which brought about a forsaking of the Lord. And when we become biblically illiterate and we start forsaking the ways of God, then what happens next? We serve something else. And that was the problem when you go back to Judges chapter 2. They began to serve the false gods, Baal and the Ashtoreths, these Canaanite gods. Look at it again in verses 12 and 13 of Judges 2. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods among the gods of the people who were all around them. Again, I want to say... They had been eyewitnesses to the magnificence and the power of God. And yet, when that generation that had been eyewitnesses did not impress that upon their children, so that when that next generation rose up and they just didn't get it, they didn't see it, they're not privy to what they need to know, then they will follow after something else. And that's just astounding to me. Are we always alarmed? When we hear about somebody that has known the truth, that has been practicing the truth, worshiping God in spirit and the truth, that have taken on the name of Christ, and when they, first of all, if they just go back out into the world, we think, that's astounding. 
Or if they take on apostate thinking and that the authority of the scripture is no longer really all that important to them. And the authority is just not emphasized. And I'm going to tell you one of the problems that is probably taking place throughout the country. And I'm not just talking about denominations, but in too many fellowships that call themselves churches of Christ. That there again is that there is a relaxation when it comes to authority based teaching and preaching. And I'll tell you what, may God help us here if we ever stop doing that. Because our children and our grandchildren will suffer for it. They're going to serve something. And that something may not be called Baal. It may not be called the Ashtoreths. But they're going to serve something. We know that they had, be complete, they had become completely wicked and immoral. Don't forget, they're serving these false gods. And what is every man doing? What's right in his own sight. The message of judges is very apropos for the American culture today and culture across the world, not just here. But we've got to think about the potential for idolatry today. Now, in our country... Is the idolatry different? Yes, but you want to know something? Because I thought about this today, so I wrote myself a little note here. Because I asked myself that question, is the potential for idolatry existent today? And so I thought about it, and I said, different, yes, but here's what I came up with. And I hope you find this to be profound. Yes, but idolatry is idolatry. Now, I want you to cogitate that for a couple of weeks. The reason why I say that is because there is a tendency at times to look at idolatry and maybe people think of some great image that's been carved out of stone or out of some tree. Or maybe something that's very pantheistic in our, in our you know, and we look and we look at nature or we look at the moon and the stars or we just, you know, or, be, or take on some kind of astrological perspective of the meaning and the movement of life. And we say, oh, we would never do that. I doubt in our fellowship that we would ever be, be drawn to this, that, that we're ever going to, you know, uh, perhaps with a, a great big crucifix in our auditorium with seemingly uh, the Savior bleeding upon the cross. And I hope not. But is that what we're always talking about when it comes to idolatry? No. Because at the end of the day, what is idolatry? What is idolatry at the end of the day? Putting anything before God. Is that not idolatrous? Two passages and we go to our final point. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. You know this passage. Most of you know this. Colossians 3, 5. The apostle Paul made this point to the brethren. To the church at Colossae and says. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication. Uncleanness. Passion. Evil. Evil desire, that is. Evil desire. And what? Covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, when you look at that, and we, I, we all understand what covetousness is. We don't have to have a Greek study on that to understand what covetousness is. And again, in this great desire for materialistic, monetary things, or just a possession of another, we understand. But what Paul says is that covetousness, which is idolatry, because the covetous mindset, is a mindset that I want something so badly that I've got to have that in my life so much that it becomes, as it were, an idol to me. This is what's going to make me happy. This is what's going to give me fulfillment or satisfaction. The Apostle Paul says it won't, but it will certainly cause you to be drawn further and further away from God. We back up in a cross-reference to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3. But fornication and uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Those are actions or activities, including covetousness, which is idolatry, that should not even be among the saints. We should not be that kind of people. And so, yes, we look back at Israel of old and we say, oh, yes, boy, they had a problem with the Baals and the Asterisks and all of that paganism and idolatry. But I want to tell you, there's just as much paganism and idolatry in 2017 America as well.
And in case you think I'm making a statement, I am. And it can be found in so many different venues. From television to internet to Facebook to social media to printed material, to it just doesn't make any difference. Uh, I'll tell you what, in the mass amount of communication that is out there, that we have become slaves to these things that have taken our focus and our attention away from regular Bible reading. I want you to ask yourself the question, how much time do we spend in the social media as compared to studying, reading and studying our Bibles? Let's talk about what we desire in this life. And let's talk about what we're going to teach our children. Our last point. You look at all of this together and because of spiritual literacy and obviously this forsaking of the Lord and serving whatever, anything other than God, we look at the text of Judges 2 and we see severe consequences. Back in our text, verses 14 and 15 of Judges 2, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were greatly distressed. You know why we have a difficult time connecting to that? Because God did that in many physical ways, manifestations back in that day. He really did. I mean, there are times God would be angry with Israel and he just might open up the ground and swallow a few thousand people. And that kind of gets people's attention, right? I mean, all we'd have to do is just have a hole open up in the foyer and just lose two or three. It would get our attention, wouldn't it? We have difficulty connecting to that. Because we don't see sometimes these kinds of physical manifestations that God had given towards Israel and other people as well in the Bible. But I want us to understand that as much as Israel was foolish to think that there would be no repercussions for their sin when God had warned them and warned them and warned them, we are equally and perhaps even more foolish because of what he's given us through the promises of Jesus Christ, but we are foolish when we think there will be no repercussions for our sin or our neglect or our forsaking. Isaiah 128. The destruction of transgressors and of sinners shall be together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. Hosea 4.6, you know this passage. My people are destroyed for lack of what? Knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. And that bothers me greatly. To think that my children or my grandchildren could be forgotten because we haven't done our job in the preservation of this great spiritual heritage. My friends, it is no different today. And in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul made it crystal clear. You know, I'm finding out more and more is I study with a lot of people and especially people with these various kinds of religious, denominational backgrounds and so forth. You know, when you come right down to it, the Apostle Paul is not a real popular guy. Which is amusing and amazing because he's the most prolific writer in the New Testament, having authored 13 books positively, possibly 14. And yet, a lot of people just don't like Paul's attitude. <laughs> maybe it's because of his directness, but whatever the case is, and maybe what they'll do is, Peter said in 2 Peter 3, they'll just take his words and twist, and twist the words of Paul just like they do with the rest of Scripture. But here's what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. A person said to me, oh my goodness, 30 years ago, 
and teaching a class and using that passage. And sitting across the table and said, well, that sounds like hellfire and brimstone. And I just commented, you think? Not trying to be flippant about it. But I'll tell you what, all of the Bible, including the New Testament, there are severe consequences. There are severe consequences. It is no difference today. Brethren, a strong spiritual heritage will not ensue if spiritual illiteracy prevails. I commend our teachers in the congregation and teaching young children, and all I can say to you is keep teaching them and get them into the Word of God. And I know there are times that they want to play games and they want to, uh, you know, play hangman or whatever else you can do in those classes from time to time. And I want to tell you, though, just get them into the Bible and the Word of God. But parents, even more so, teach your children the Word of God. Does the next generation know the Lord? Will the next generation know the Lord? We must not fail as fathers and mothers and husbands and wives and grandparents and aunts and uncles and certainly as brethren in Christ, we must not fail. We cannot afford to fail. Or else it may once again be said, there arose another generation after them which did not know the Lord. And I ask you seriously to meditate on these things. Thank you. If we can help you in any spiritual need that you may have, in coming to the Lord, let's sit down and study the Bible together. If you need to make any acknowledgement, whatever it is you need, let that be known. But we extend to you the Lord's invitation at this time. Won't you come at this time as we stand, as we sing?